Ahoy, mateys! I'm Anthony from the Culture Cave, and I'm here to talk about 1899. It's an upcoming show by Baron Baudo and Jon Chafrisa. Come to Netflix. It seems like it's probably the 17th of November, based on what Netflix is showing, but there's been some rumors that maybe it's going to come a little earlier. Let's hope it does. Now, it really pains me to say, but recently there's actually been some news about 1899. I didn't know if I was going to cover it because of spoilers and things, but uh, episode one and two basically was shown at the Toronto International Film Festival. I wasn't there, unfortunately. I would have loved to be. And there's been now some reports coming out. I've decided to go with it and uh, talk about it because although I don't want to get in for full-blown spoilers, I think a few extra details given by a news article are okay. Well, I'm okay with that. So if you're okay with like one or two extra details, maybe like a character's profession and things being given, uh, then you stick about. Um, if you're not, then I will see you in the next video, which will be a theory at some point. But in this episode, we're going to go through an article from Blickpunkt Film, which we've covered them on the channel before, uh, about 1899 at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, and there will be minor spoilers, so again, warning. But before we get into that, if you are interested in time travel, and I know a lot of you on this channel are interested in time travel, we've just done three videos on Back to the Future. If you haven't seen them, check them out. And at the end of this month, we'll be starting our series on The Terminator. So we're gonna do The Terminator 1, 2, and 3. Don't miss it, it's gonna be great. Lots of time travel fun. Can't wait to see you there. All right, so let's get into this article then. So we've covered Blickpunkt on the channel before. They've actually put out a article about the initial um, details about 1899 way back maybe even two years ago at this point seems crazy that it was that long ago but i think it was and they've put out a review it is in german unfortunately um i am a member of a uh, 1899 sort of theory and discussion discord i will be placing the link to that in the description i've done that before it's a great discord if you want to talk about 1899 if you want sort of the inside scoop on what the fans are thinking that's where to go there's been a great uh translation done for me well, it's not been done for me, but there's been a great translation done by Len von Geist. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, Len von Geist. Um, and basically, they're a, they're a German speaker who've, who've translated this. So hopefully, it'll be pretty good. Last time I translated from this website, it was full-blown um, just Google Translate, and there was a lot of issues because of that. This time, hopefully, it'll be a lot better. Okay, so to begin with, uh, let's go through this together. The article begins, it's done. Jon Chafrisa and Baron Baudor presented their second mystery series for Netflix. 1899. To much applause from the Canadian audience at the Toronto International Film Festival, where works Who Am I, No System Is Safe, and Dark had already been celebrated, uh, had already celebrated world premieres. Now, this was news to me because I didn't actually realize, because obviously I didn't watch Dark Season 1 until it came out on Netflix itself. Um, so therefore, I didn't know that they actually screened the first two episodes at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, this one, this show, has a lot more buzz about it than Dark did when it first came on. And obviously that's because of the, the success of Dark. Um, so it makes sense to me that uh, this time it's a little bit more... Uh, to be honest with you, it's not actually, it's not actually too um, controversial putting it on the Toronto International Film Festival. But this time there's a lot more fans who wish they could have seen it. And now they have to wait a few months than last time. Last time it was probably... Not even, no, no even articles about it, you know what I mean? Whereas this time, it's just much, much bigger of a deal because it's like the second album, you know? Um, but anyway, so Dark had already been uh, there for a world premiere. We took uh, a look at the first two episodes of the eight-episode season. So again, confirmation, it's going to be an eight-episode season. Good to know. Okay, so first, now, I don't know how much new spoilery stuff is in this first couple of paragraphs. I'm going to read it anyway because who knows, there might be something. But if there's any new, so if there's any new information, I'll have a chat about it. If not, I'll just skip on by. Uh, first announced almost four years ago, 1899 is a second Netflix series from creative couple Jon Chafrisa and Baron Baudo. The story of immigrants from across Europe who attempt to cross to New York on a passenger ship, but along the way come across another migrant ship that was thought to be missing. One and a half years ago, the first clapperboard fell. <laughs> Seems like ages. One and a half years. Jeez, it really has been that long. And now it is finally finished. The sequel to Dark. Back then, Frieser and Odor had already written German series history. The first German Netflix series, which proved to be a pop cultural phenomenon worldwide. Netflix's greatest show, by the way, according to uh, Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> the two filmmakers did not rest on their laurels, but used the success as a springboard to think even bigger, conceive more boldly and direct more confidently in their new work. In several respects, 1899 is now also breaking new ground. Set just before the leap into the new century, in the heyday of the Bell, oh, Bell, set in the heyday of the Bell, a, 
Puck. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, I might have to Google Translate that. It may have been made out of Germany, but it is wholeheartedly a European series, with actors from different countries, each speaking their own language. A cinematic Tower of Babel, which is, the likes of which has never been seen before in this cosmopolitan form. And it is the first German production to be shot in the specially built LED volume, The Dark Bay. Uh, so this is like obviously the volume we've seen pictures of before that um, they've made in Germany, Babel, uh, Babelsberg, uh, I believe, maybe. Uh, where they uh, have the full-on volume, just like Disney does um, for The Mandalorian and things. So they're doing that for this show, which is fantastic. Um, so nothing that has ever been shot in Germany has ever looked like this before. And that's a good point, actually. So Disney did this huge thing for The Mandalorian, and then all of a sudden Netflix funds uh, these really sort of inspiring original uh, filmmakers to make this TV show with this technology. I didn't... Back whenever we heard about the Mandalorian making this technology and using this technology, I never would have conceived that we would have seen this on something that wasn't as mainstream so quickly. Now, Netflix is mainstream, of course it is. There's going to be maybe some more Netflix oversight on this than there was on Dark because it is much, I'm assuming, bigger budgets with this LED volume. Having said that, it's really cool to see this uh, creative storytelling done, which isn't just like adding to the Star Wars or Marvel universe, you know. So I'm really, really excited to see what they do with that. Uh, so nothing has ever been done like this before and uh, it mentions here another cool thing is that the familiar team is back again so obviously the two showrunners have come back but also they've brought back cinematographer Nicholas Summerer and I actually personally love the look of Dark um, I, I'm sure with a bigger budget um, they'll be able to make it look even better but I was happy with the way Dark looked to be honest with you and set designer Udo Kramer now set designer Udo Kramer is interesting to me because I personally loved the sets of Dark as you went through the uh the show they became more grandiose and more otherworldly uh you know so it, it really did become like a real science fiction show you know which at the very beginning it was much more humble beginnings um just with the different houses and the school and then as you move through you start getting like adam's lair and you start getting obviously the caves are fantastic as well that that would be great um but then you start getting eva's lair as well it all becomes very otherworldly so i'm interested to see what happens as we go through the seasons of this show because i'm assuming 1899 is going to go to similar heights as dark similar depth um we're going to introduce new characters new locations i'm s interested to see especially with all my theories about underworlds and things are they actually going to do something like that uh if so mr kramer has his uh work cut out for him oscar nominated costume designer abina daigle hmm. this one's hard oscar nominated costume designer bina daigle we'll go with that, was involved in uh, a Frieza and Oda project for the first time. So this is actually a new costume designer. Now that's interesting because the, the dark costumes were good. Uh, maybe that costume designer was was tied up or maybe they wanted someone who had specifically had uh, some experience with period costume. I'm not sure. Um, well, I say period costume, I mean older period costume because of course dark was also a period show, funny enough. Uh, okay, here we go. So this is the details. This is the part which everyone's just skipped to. Uh, I will put the uh, timestamps or the chapters or whatever you call them in the description. So you can skip to this if you want. Don't know why I'm saying that now. You would have already skipped here. Welcome. Okay, so the focus is on an English doctor played by Emily Beecham. Now, when I first read this, I haven't actually seen the film Little Joe. But when I first read this, um, it says Little Joe in brackets. And I just jumped out of my seat going, Little Joe, oh my God, she, you know, she's going by a different alias because her name is meant to be Maura Franklin. Obviously, that's just a film she's been in before. Um, having said that, the fact that it says she's an English doctor, but we see clips in the trailer of her being like restrained, um, that's really interesting to me. I, I, I don't believe she is a doctor. I think we've we've sort of long theorized that she's going to go undercover. On undercover is the wrong word, but conceal her identity to get onto this ship and to go uh, looking for something. It's always been known she's looking for something. Um, but I don't think she's a doctor. If she is a doctor, I think she might, she might be disgraced or she might be um, have been found, uh, you know, cl clinically, you know, crazy. I don't know, like mentally ill because she was being um, held down. Now, I did theorize before that potentially she has already been to where the ship is going to go, uh, which then led me to think that she was in the uh, psychiatric ward or in a mental institution based on uh, that 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 story she was telling of where she was um but i don't think she's a doctor i do think that that isn't that's going to turn out to be um an alias of some sort i 
Again, maybe she is, but I, I find it hard to see. We'll see, we'll see. Um, so, Emily Beecham, who's on board the passenger ship Kerberos to search for her brother. Now, there's extra information again. Her brother. Now, who could her brother be? Who could her brother be? So, I think um, this is her brother. No, no, sorry. I don't think... That, this could be her brother. I'm not sure if it is, actually. When I first read this, I did think of this child from the trailer, um, who obviously... I suspect was on the other ship, the Prometheus. I do. I suspected that this child was, in fact, her brother, but I don't know anymore. Um, there's a potential because in this, in the trailer, Mora is trying to sort of hold his, hold him, or sort of stroke his hair, sort of try and, you know, try and, um, be, you know, be empathetic towards him and, and sort of settle him down or bring him out. So maybe this is her brother, or maybe this is just a child who she sort of takes responsibility for. Um, so it's interesting, interesting to see. We know she's looking for something. We got confirmation now to her brother, um, who was also on. Her brother was on the sister ship, the Prometheus. I do believe this child was on the Prometheus. Um, whether that's the, the the child, I'm not sure. And we also just left put that on the screen just to remind us. Pretty sure that is the child's arm um, with the sort of stone pyramid thing, um, which which is going to be interesting. Uh, so the Prometheus disappeared without a trace on its way to New York. Um, now, we knew that already. Uh, yeah, just confirmation, basically. Um, Andreas Peterman, who obviously is from Dark, he uh, plays an equally important role um, as the captain who is supposed to bring the passengers to America. Now, I look at that, that language there. That word, supposed to. <laughs> the word, supposed. So, I think that's fantastic, like, hinting in this article because I think that technically the captain's supposed to do that. But obviously, I believe him to be part of this cult um, with uh, with with the rest of them, you know, drinking the tea in unison. I think he's part of that, and I think I think maybe based on the trailer, like you know, his house burning down or someone's house burning down, um, it's unwilling, you know, that he's doing it. But I do, I do think that he is part of the the plan of to, to change the course of the ship. So the fact that it says the captain who is supposed to bring the passengers to to America, I think that implies that he's not bringing them of his own accord um, and his or his own choices. Um, or based on the cult choices that he's involved in. In addition, there are other passengers from first class, lower deck, and the engine room. This makes sense because we have uh, we've seen you know clips and images of characters from all different uh, parts of the boat. Um, everyone carries their secret, their little bag with them. Now the little bag with them, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a translation issue. Um, in fact, let me check. A few moments later. Apparently it's equivalent, according to Len from Discord, that's equivalent to, like, everyone has their cross to bear, for example. I immediately was jumping out of a seat again, thinking, oh my god, they've literally got a little bag with a secret in them. Is this like Pandora's boxy sort of thing? Um, yeah, so, no, they don't have a little bag. Not everyone carries a little bag with a secret inside. Um, it means they're cross to bear. Um, and we all, we sort of knew that already. The characters of uh, the actors, actors and actresses, as well as the creators, have sort of talked about in the past the idea that everyone has their own issues, um, and I believe I've also stated in the past that I think those issues that they have and the the lack of you know sort of getting along on the ship that the different classes or the different uh, you know nationalities are going to have is going to lead to uh, a greater problem not being foreseen, kind of like the White Walkers, for example, um, in in Game of Thrones. Then the ship receives strange radio signals. The Prometheus reappears. Now, the strange radio signals, we've seen them as well. We've seen so, some sort of signals coming through. We've seen this big, what I assume is a communication device, um, the really cool sort of brass moving uh, prop looks great in the wall of the in the wall of the ship. I'm assuming that's where that's coming through, and they all look very very shocked because maybe that shouldn't be happening. Um, and the Prometheus reappears, and we've seen that as well with the flare being shot out. Uh, but it turns out to be just deserted except for only one passenger. And obviously we've met that passenger. Uh, I say obviously. I think there's no doubt that this is the, the one passenger that was left. Uh, the, the scenes from the trailer very much imply to me that this this is an outsider on their ship and they're trying to sort of get information out of him or trying to you know console him for what's happened or something like that. And then with that, in the second episode, strange things begin to happen on the Kerberos in addition to the tension that already exists. So the tension already exists. There we go. We talked about the idea. Now, it's very early on this was mentioned it was about Brexit. It was mentioned that there was going to be problems for each character. So there's already tension going on between the classes or the uh, nationalities or whatever. So then you've got this extra, this, 
you've got this extra uh, bout of strange things that starts happening. Um, and I think that, and I think that, I've got a picture there on the screen of um, of the one of the members of the Danish family carrying her little sister or her daughter, whoever this this might be. Um, I believe that this is going to start happening. If people are disappearing, it makes sense to me that people would be, you know, either dying or becoming unconscious or becoming sleeping. I've theorized before about people being frozen um, and therefore perhaps this ha is happening to this character as well. Um, yeah, so so let me know what you think about that. I do, I do think that uh, this scene here might be one of the strange things that's starting to happen. What other strange things should start to happen? Let me know in the comments what you think. And then lastly, it says, if one ship is called the Kerberos and the other Prometheus, there must be a reason for it. And this, uh, there must be a reason for it in, the, in this meticulously constructed and fascinatingly her hermetically sealed world. Uh, it is fantasy or reality, madness or dream, vision or nightmare. Is the ship a Petri dish or an organism? The people on board, wanton experiments or simply a random cross section of society? Or all of the above? Or none of the above. Each of the interpretations seems possible. Each of them makes sense after the first two episodes. None of them has to be the path that 1899 takes in the coming six episodes. At the end of which, a few questions may be answered, but certainly many more may be asked. Um, this That is the talent of Jan Frisa and Baron Baudor. The power of illusion. The, pl they, the, the play with symbols, colors, and shapes. The will to create a fateful atmosphere the fateful atmosphere interesting so the idea of fate come, maybe comes into this this one as well that'd be cool um very dark centric theme that one isn't it the talent for scattered cr scattering crumbs that the viewer eagerly follows in 1899 the la on the largest but also densest canvas on which the creative couple have paint have painted so far with a sovereign conviction of the power of their images at the end of each of the first two episodes are montages to sounds of classic rock songs White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane in the first, Child in Time by Deep Purple in the second, and the realization that new doors are opening again, of which you don't know what is behind them. The only thing you know for sure is that you urgently want to find out as soon as possible. Whoa, okay, that's amazing. So they are gonna have the montages again. Oh, yes, I love that that's sort of their, one of their trademarks to the way they make, the, they make TV. I love those from Dark. I love the montages. Also, the, the songs do actually always have a meaning to what's happening. They do actually thematically fit. So maybe I'll be listening to a lot of White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane and a lot of Child in Time by Deep Purple. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to have a look at those because maybe I've got some theories that could come out of there. We do have a couple of months left of theorizing before we get the first full series, and then we will be theorizing to season two. So there you go, guys. That was the article from Blick Punked. If you would like to theorize with me, stay on the channel, give us a subscribe, give us a like, all that sort of stuff. It does help us. This one was sort of a more free flowing uh, video than normal. I like to put out very regimented theory videos where I sort of script them. This one's obviously just reacting to uh, um, this uh, article based on the screening that took place in the Toronto International Film Festival. So if you would like, this is the first time you've ever seen my channel, if you would like to see some more regimented theories, why don't you click uh, one of these links in the description. I'll put a few uh, theories in the description and uh, at the end of the video I'll put some, some links as well. Um, but yeah, check those out. I've got plenty more theories to come. I've got one or two big theories that I've been meaning to make for a while. Um, but you know, life gets in the way. Um, so they are going to be coming out soon, hopefully. Um, one is around alchemy, because we've all been talking about the idea that the, the cult symbol is Earth. So there's some thoughts behind that. As well as that, um, there's a couple more um, developments in terms of the Greek mythology um, aspect of the of the show, which uh, there's a, someone on uh, the subreddit who is ch working just as hard as me to try and find the links to Greek, Greek mythology, and I think so, a couple of things have been hit upon. So I'll be making a video about that re soon as well. Apart from that, there'll be plenty more stuff to come. Terminator, all sorts of stuff. Bad guy breakdowns from Conrad. So guys, thanks very much for joining with me while I read this uh, read this article, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.